book called, that's called Philippians. It's a letter from Paul, but sometimes it's called the book of joy. It's the most joyful of all of Paul's letters. Sometimes he yelled at the churches he had founded when he wrote back to them later about not doing things well. And other times he praised them lavishly. And that was true for the people at Philippi, for that church he had founded. So as we read, also think about that he was writing from a Roman prison. And Paul was one that always was talking about being joyful no matter what. But he's writing this letter from jail. So let's listen to the words from Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I hope some of you uh, sometime can come to Wednesday night Bible study. I know the people in the choir can't really do it, but we have a very interesting time there. What we do is we study the scripture for the next Sunday. And it's very, uh, it really opens my mind as to what is on people's minds about the scripture. And it's done in a format where we ask questions. We fill up a board with questions. Chuck used to write them, but Jeannie has the best handwriting. So she now writes them on the board. And then we sort of make an agreement of how we're going to go through the questions and how we're going to, to um, how we, what we think about them. And it's guided by the class, even though I might be making sure that the class stays in good order. And so the question that intrigued me most that was put on the board was this one. What does it mean to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? Good question. It's one I worked with all week. It's the one I thought was the most difficult to answer. Because doesn't the Bible say, do not fear, like about 200 times at least? And didn't the people at Philippi already trust in their salvation? Weren't they already saved? And so what does it mean to work out your salvation. And Paul loved the people at the church in Philippi, so why would he ever want them to fear and tremble like you might do at a very bad time in your life or in a haunted house or just something scary? He loved them, we know, because he said, for example, in chapter 1 and all throughout, I thank God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy for each one of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul founded this church. You might remember the story where he wanted to go somewhere else, but the Spirit sent him towards Greece, 
And he came to Philippi and he wanted to meet some people and finally he went down to the riverbank and met Lydia, who was a seller of purple cloth and she became the first European believer. The first one to know about Jesus. And then she invited them to her house and the rest was history for the church at Philippi. So it seems like the church at Philippi is the last one you would want to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So I'm thinking that Paul seemed to know that we all need encouragement, A, and we all get distracted, B, we all get sidetracked from what's really important, no matter how long we have known about the gospel, no matter how long ago we put our faith in it, even if we come to church every week, even if we read the Bible every day, we still get distracted. And so I think this is what Paul is highlighting. And so he highlights several things in his letter, and I'll get to the question in a minute. The first one he highlights is unity among believers. Be of the same mind. And the second thing he highlights is what that mind is. And that's the mind of Christ. So maybe think about leaders in your church, in your life, that had a certain mind and someone else's mind didn't agree with that mind and there was disunity. And so Paul is saying, everybody needs to have the mind of one person alone, and that's Jesus. Let your mind be the same mind as in Jesus So that sounds good enough because Jesus is exalted and Jesus is important. But Paul says, remember, Jesus is the one that went to the cross. Let your unified mind be the same one as the person that God sent, who was God and human, who was obedient like a slave. So everyone in this room, if he's talking, if we were Philippi, he's saying, everybody have the same mind That mind is Jesus, and that mind is self-sacrificing and is only interested in the interests of others. That is a tall order. Think now about any disunity you've known in in a church you've been at maybe over your whole life from the beginning to now. Anytime people's minds didn't agree, maybe it was because the mind of Christ wasn't the one that was being followed. So Paul is talking about our choices, our actions, and our priorities when he says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. It's not that we're not saved. It's not that we're not accepted. It's not that we're not redeemed. But there's a lot more to do that God wants you to do after you know that. And so God, so Paul is saying, continue to work into, out of, and about your salvation with fear and trembling, but he says, don't worry, for God is at work in you, enabling you to will and to work for God's good pleasure, for things that please God. When God is at work in your life and your actions and your decisions in that way, I think Paul is describing the truth about fear and trembling. The very first time that in seminary that I was asked to even pretend like I was officiating over the Lord's Supper. I couldn't sleep the night before in a cla- for a class. Same when I pretended or was trained to baptize. I promise you there was fear and trembling. The words came out silly when I was officiating at the pretend table we had to practice. And I really thought I was going to die of embarrassment. Think about the people that you know of God's people who experienced fear and trembling when God asked them to do something. Think about Moses, who trembled before the burning bush, threw off his shoes because of the burning bush. What do you think Mary, the mother of Jesus, was like when the angel Gabriel came to her and said, you're going to have a baby by the Holy Spirit? I think that was the calmest moment of her life like having a latte and just sitting down and chilling? I don't think so. Before she said, yes, I will, I can't imagine how her heart must have been beating. Paul said to the church in Corinth, 
when he wrote them, he said, I came to you to share the gospel with fear and trembling. I wonder what he meant by that. Maybe he came feeling like he wasn't good enough, like I honestly feel almost every week when I'm standing here. How can I even talk about this? I'm not good enough for that. Maybe Paul is saying that. I was fearful. I wasn't good enough. I wouldn't say the right thing. You wouldn't accept what I said. So I love to hear the stories, and I've heard many of your stories of when you first believed, when you realized that you were saved by what Jesus did on the cross. Some of you have told me about times when you were young, times when you were older, specific places where you were. But I also love to hear the stories of how you reacted to God with fear and trembling. I think of, for me, um, when I left my law practice, left all that, the income, the identity after 25 years, my house to live in Atlanta for three years away from Chuck, That was fear and trembling. I think about Drew and Susie, a couple that we met in seminary that went at the same time as us, who sold everything that they had to move up to Atlanta around 50 years old to go to seminary because God said, I want you to go, and there was fear and trembling. I think about a client in my law firm. He he drove heavy equipment at a surface mine, a phosphate mine. He noticed that there were some dangerous things going on there at the mine. And he tried to put tape around the areas after he told the supervisor, and the supervisor said, I don't care. He knew he might get fired, and he continued to point out that people could be hurt. And he was fired. He was fired. Can you imagine there was fear and trembling doing the right thing Um, He went to another Presbyterian church in our area, but he knew that was the right thing. I know three different single women who fostered young children in the last few years and adopted them. One is in her 50s, one was 20, and one a little older. That's God calling you. Do you think there's some fear and trembling? Is there some fear and trembling? So all these things were done because God was nudging them for God's pleasure, for God's work, to do God's work. And most of the work that we do for God is in our ordinary lives. And the people at Philippi were ordinary people. The church was a tiny minority in that city. It was just starting out. So I want you to think about some of the things God might be nudging you to do that you might be avoiding because of fears or because it makes your heart beat fast, which might be like trembling. For example, when you feel like God is nudging you towards being a friend to someone that is not befriended by many people at school or at work or in the church, when you feel that nudge to go talk to that person, you go, no, Maybe they don't want to talk. Maybe I'll be embarrassed. Or when you feel that nudge to change careers because that's what God wants you to do, but you're fearful of what might happen. Or to take part in volunteer work that you've been nudging, you've been thinking about, that's something God might want you to do. But you would have all new people you'd have to meet. It'd be an inconvenient day of the week. You'd have to drive a ways to take time to rest when it's in the interest of your family, but you're not sure you can do it. You're not sure. Maybe somebody will get mad at you if you rest, even though you know it's in the interest of others. To come to your first Wednesday night Bible study or to sing in the choir. Just try it for a week. Is that all right, to try it for a week? Or to sit behind a table selling pumpkins. Katherine Johnson is someone I admire who was willing to follow and do God's work in her life that benefited others. 
She's 99 years old now, and she's a member at Carver Memorial Presbyterian Church in Newport News, Virginia. She sang in the choir for more than 50 years. She can't do it now. She was a church officer, and she was chosen by her presbytery there to go to the National Assembly in 1975 to represent her presbytery in the whole sea of Presbyterians from around the nation. When God created Catherine, he gave her great abilities in mathematics. She would count when there was no need to be counting. She grew up on a farm, but she had such special gifts that her family did everything in its power to make sure she could get the education for her gifts. Because of the color of her skin, her family had to go through many barriers to accomplish this. And after she graduated, she worked for a time as a teacher. Years later, in the 1950s, when NASA first announced it would hire people of color and women to work for it, based on the suggestion of a family member, she went to work for NASA at the Langley Research Center in the mid-50s. Maybe you've seen her story in the movie Hidden Figures. She believed in using the gifts that God had given her and to follow the call that God had for her life despite incredible obstacles. To use the bathroom when she first came to this place, she had to go way across the parking lot to another building because the bathroom was for white only. She ended up being the one who calculated the trajectory for John Glenn in his first um, space flight first American in space, and it was said, I'm sorry, Alan Shepard, it was said that John Glenn wouldn't go unless she recalculated what the man who had calculated the trajectory had done. During her time at NASA, God used Catherine and her friends to change people's minds, to open doors, because she did things where we might fear and tremble, and I'm sure she did too. Her story is told with such power in the movie Hidden Figures. And for me, she's an example of potential and possibility in the life of a person of faith who is not afraid to be afraid, who is not afraid to tremble, who is not afraid to do things for others using her gifts. What's most amazing, I read an article about her, is she was humble. I had to laugh out loud when I read that her pastor said that he was at the church three years before he ever heard of what she had done. Can you imagine that? One of my favorite Christian preachers and writers, Barbara Brown Taylor, Episcopalian, she wrote, when a preacher finishes a sermon, the only name that should be on people's lips is Jesus Christ. When someone finishes a sermon, the only name that should be on your lips is Jesus Christ. Maybe Paul was wanting to redirect people from themselves and their own achievements back to Jesus Christ. Maybe that's why he said, do things in fear and trembling and humility. Maybe he wanted to remind them that if they do something good, it's 100% God. And if they want to do something good, God will be behind them 100%. So he reminded them to keep Christ at the center of everything they did. And to remember that Jesus always put his interests above the interests of anyone, below the interests of anyone else, even to death on a cross. On Communion Sunday which is World Communion Sunday, we will soon hold the broken bread that Paul's talking about. The pieces of broken bread of Jesus who put the interests of others before his own. We'll soon share the cup that he poured for his disciples to give them strength to do what he did. I think we need the power that comes from his humility. I think we need that power that perfects our weakness. To God be the glory. Amen.